for the first two to three months, I was miserable. The gentleman did not pay me any mind at all. When I would go to the lunchroom to eat, they would not sit at the same table as I did because I was a black woman. Uh, it, was, it was horrible. And I'll give you two little incidents that perhaps it shows it show you that I, I had a sense of humor about a lot of things. There was a little dining room beneath the house, uh, the, the floor of the house. And that was a place where we could go to get a bite if we were going to have a long day. And I did not know that in that dining room the tables were designated to the different delegations. There was a table for New York, a table for Alabama, a table for... And I went one day to go down and sit at the table. I sat at a table because nobody was sitting there. Ten chairs to the table. And I ordered my lunch. I was very hungry that day. And I got dessert and salad and a little bit of everything put on the table. And, and I always took the New York Times and read it while I was eating because nobody would sit by me. So this day, I felt something hovering around me. I looked up, and if looks could kill, I would have been, I would have been dead. I, because I was seated at the Georgian delegation table and didn't know it. Oh my goodness, <laughs> of all tables. I was at the Georgian delegation <laughs> table and didn't know it. And this man stood up and looked at me and said, You sit at the wrong table. <laughs> I said, what did you say? She said, I said, you see that wrong table. I said, what table is this? Yeah, your delegation. Oh, I said, but you see, the tables do not have any labels. I didn't know, but tomorrow I will find out where New York sits here, <laughs> and then I will go to New York. So I continued to eat. And he continued, ah, I said, <laughs> You will sit at the Jordan delegation table. And I said, I say, if you don't, if you don't move from here, I will so and so and so. And I, but then I began to feel sorry for him because he was hungry. And I decided to use a different psychological approach. And I said, you're hungry, aren't you? And it's the first time he gave me a smile because I was nice to him. I said, yes. you're hungry. He said, sure I'm hungry. I said, I know what your problem is. Your problem is you cannot sit at this table because a black person is seated at the table. Isn't that right? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I am going to help you. You see that table over there? There's a table diagonally across from the table I was sitting, and there's nobody at it. I said, look, you go over and you sit at that table, you order your lunch. And if anybody bothers you, you tell them, see Shirley Chisholm. <laughs> I thought this would embarrass him, but it did not. This was the funniest thing to me. It did not embarrass him. He went right over to the table, <laughs> and he sat, and he sat, <laughs> and he sat down. Uh, it just proves how ludicrous all this is. Oh, oh it, it's ridiculous. It? Then there was yes. then this other one, and this almost brought the house down. There was a gentleman that sat on the aisle seat on the aisle on the on the house floor. My office was on the other side of the building, so when I would come to the floor, he could see me coming through because my office was on that side of the building upstairs, and he could see me coming down because where I was going to sit was right behind him. And every day I would come down and come through, and he would cough so badly. So one day I said to Brock Adams, who was the representative from the state of Washington, I said, why don't somebody do something for that poor man? He sounds like he has... TB. <laughs> There's something wrong with him. Yes. And he says, Shirley, I was waiting for you. He said, I want to tell you something. You got to do something. I said, what? He said, every time he sees you coming down and coming through, he starts coughing. And then when you come by his seat, he takes his handkerchief out. He spits in the handkerchief in your face. This was his way of greeting me in the United States House of Representatives. I said, he does, bro? I said, I thought, he said, uh-uh, what are you going to do about it? I said, watch me tomorrow. I had a sweater suit. And the jacket, the jacket of the sweater had big pockets. And I went out and I bought, purchased a male handkerchief. <laughs> and I put it in the pocket. And the next day when I came in, sure enough, he started a coughing. I said, uh-huh, baby. 
I'm going to fix you today. So just as I came, I was run by the seat. By then, I had it synchronized as to when he would pull the handkerchief out to meet my face and then spit in the handkerchief. I said, yes, sir, that day, pull the handkerchief out just in time to spit in it and put it, put it in his face. And I said to him, meet you to today. <laughs> From that day, he never coughed anymore. I bet he didn't. <laughs> There is that persistence. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, not he putting up with nonsense. Yes, that's right. That's yes. right, sure. And the men, I'll never forget, the men upstairs in the balcony, there were the uh, newspaper men, and they saw this from upstairs in the balcony as I was coming in, and they almost toppled over the top. They roared. <laughs> and the speaker had to pick their, there'll be order in this house. <laughs> yes. But, you know, it sounds like you also had allies. Oh, yes. Because people were roaring, for example. Oh, yeah. And, and so, another thing, the, the house was so boring at times that they'd do anything, you know, to make, uh, to have something. Say, sure, give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. <laughs> was it difficult to return to Congress after your campaign for president? No, it was not difficult. No. I became even more popular. <laughs> I became more popular, you know. More popular. Yeah, more popular. <laughs> Was there any noticeable change in the way your colleagues treated you in Congress? Oh, yes. What they, happened? They, they treated me in strange. They didn't realize I was so smart. You know, quote, they, 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 they were really, some of them approached me and said, you got a brain. I said, I've always had a brain. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they be little women so badly. Yes. <laughs> Do you think that that is still a oh, problem? Oh, no, it's gone. No, because the women that we have in Congress now, we have 43 women in Congress. Yes. They give them the business. They do? Oh, yes. They give them the business. I wouldn't be surprised in another, let's say another 10 years from now. Yes. We don't have a half and half. Yes. I will not let's be hope surprised. So. More and more women are getting the guts and the, to, to, to run. What about for the presidency? Oh, a woman is going to be president. Within the next 10 years, maybe? Next 25 years. 25 yes. years? Yes, she will be yes. president. Do you uh, think before, it will be a woman of color? No, 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 no. no. Mm -mm. I believe that before a woman can become president of this country, uh, a woman has to be a vice president, first of all, uh -huh. so that we will get used to the idea of a woman uh, ascending that high office. That's what I believe. I, don't I know. see. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. In 1982, you decided not to seek another term in Congress. Why did you make that decision? Reagan. <laughs> Tell us about Reagan. I, many of the programs and many of the things that I've been interested in, I saw how they deteriorated. I, I saw how many things were pushed back on the back burner. And uh, many of the things that I had been involved in uh, were no longer a part of his overall domestic programs. And I, I just, it was just too much. I, I said I didn't want to go through it anymore. That was it. That was it. I had enough. Yes, that was it. Mm -hmm.